This excellent medical student-led podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as medical advice under any circumstance. Welcome back, everyone. It's been a little while since we've recorded an episode. I think officially now this is season three. We have two new hosts joining me behind the mic that are going to be leading this season here at Northwestern, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. I am Nathan Kulapur. I'm a current fourth-year medical student here at Northwestern. I'm very excited to help with the hosting of Alert and Oriented for this year. So I'm originally from southeastern Ohio and went to undergrad at Ohio State. I'm interested in internal medicine and fun fact for something I like to do outside of school. So I'm really into a lot of outdoor stuff. So I enjoy a lot of hiking, biking, kayaking. I'm actually currently in the process of training for the Chicago Triathlon this year. Cool. Nice, dude. <laughs> I am Kaushik. Kandapi. I'm a fourth year student here at Northwestern as well, classmates with Nathan, um, and I'm really excited to help take over some of the hosting duties for this year's season of Alert and Oriented. I'm originally from Southeast Michigan, and I went to the University of Michigan for undergrad, Go Blue, and, no. and what I'm planning on applying into internal medicine this September. And outside of medicine, I like to play tennis. My girlfriend recently got a cat, so I like to play with my girlfriend's cat when I can. And I like to just kind of explore Chicago. I'm still new to the city, even three years in now. And so I just like to kind of find new places and just walk around. So for today's episode, we have two of our classmates here who are joining us, and I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Okay, I'm Lena. My name is Lena Volpe. I'm a fourth year medical student. I am from outside of Chicago. I went to Princeton for undergrad and I am applying into ob -GYN. In my free time, I like to paint. I too am a crazy cat person. That's pretty much it. It's painting cats for me. Wow. Cats are great. <laughs> yeah, two solid hobbies. Okay, well, hi, I'm Devin Kosky, also a fourth year here at Northwestern. Love cats too, so I'm on that. <laughs> I'm originally from Las Vegas, went to Duke for undergrad, applying into internal medicine. And my most recent hobby is I'm taking golf lessons. So that's been fun. Oh, wow, yeah. nice. Like putt-putt or I don't know. <laughs> I like go to the driving oh, range nice. and watch the real We're starting <laughs> there, but like the goal is to eventually do like full course. Building up to putt-putt? Yes, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. So without further ado, we can get started with today's case. So we will just start with a chief complaint. We are going to be talking about a patient today who is a 24-year-old female with no known past medical history who presents to us with one week of right-sided chest pain. And that's all we know right now. So this is a really broad presentation. And so I would just love to know what are your guys' initial thoughts after hearing this? I think my first thought is that I want to know more about the chest pain. Uh, I want to know what kind of, is it sharp? Is it sort of with breaths? Is it related to activity at all? We love old carts. We love old carts. I would want to know, is there any other associated symptoms? Like, does she have any kind of infection right now? Yeah, I think she's building off that, like anything new going on a week ago, any recent illnesses. I mean, she's young, so probably like less concerning about like some like ACS picture, mm -hmm. but then, you know, could this be a respiratory problem? Could also be like GI. My right side. I love that you're pointing out, trying to get a sense of the tempo of this, like, you know, that it come on acutely or mm -hmm. more gradually. So, and then also, you know, trying to get more detailed history from this patient. I think it's a great place to start. And you're already broadening your differential. You know, this is happening for one week. So that'd mm -hmm. be weird for ACS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also in a 24 year old. Mm -hmm. it's like those two can better seem to be really pushing you away from ACS. And Devin was talking about extra cardiac causes of chest pain. Absolutely. So I think right now it sounds like we, you know, with a really broad initial presentation, starting to think about different buckets. You know, Devin mentions respiratory versus GI versus cardiac. You know, a lot of potential things that could cause chest pain in a young female. Mm -hmm. So you guys asked some questions, some more information you wanted to know, thinking about infection versus some exertional component. How about we give you a little bit more information? Sounds good. Yes. Okay, so we later find out that during the past week, she's also been complaining of fevers, chills, dyspnea on exertion, and a dry cough. And we also learned that she's a refugee from South America who arrived to the U.S. approximately three months ago, and she's been living at a refugee shelter since arrival. 
So we started with a really broad presentation, now have some new really kind of key information mm -hmm. as far as review systems and also previous history as well. So how does this new information kind of move things up and down your differential? How does it change how you're thinking about these buckets? Yeah, good question. I would say in the setting of fevers, chills, dyspnea, and a cough, to me that makes me think more of an infectious picture and that the chest pain might be related to some kind of infectious etiology. It's in the context of her being from South America and now living in a refugee center, I think that also, well, you know, we think about like bugs that are sort of common in the United States and then yeah. there's like a whole other host of bugs that you think about based on where a patient may be coming from or where like their current living situation, like things like tuberculosis. I yeah, I've been supportive of that too. I think similarly, initially I was like, TB, I need to make sure we think that. <laughs> Yeah, I think like other things we didn't talk about that I was kind of thinking of just mm -hmm. given her age was like costochondritis, like a musculoskeletal thing, which like this is definitely lower down now. Or like sometimes like anxiety, panic attacks, especially at a young age, can also kind of cause some sort of chest pain. So obviously definitely lower given like the infectious picture we've been talking about. I know she has like a, she's a refugee, she's only been here for three months, she's in yeah. a refugee shelter. So there could be a lot of anxiety. Yeah, could also be two separate things. Always important to think about too. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would want to know, like, exposures. Has she been around anyone that's been sick? Obviously, probably, like, check. At this point, I, if she was in the AD, it'd be, like, check. Get more about her past medical history, past mm -hmm. surgical history, that kind of thing. But then, like, vitals, you know, blood work, chest x-ray would be, like, the first things I would go for. I think that your reasoning is, makes a lot of sense. You know, thinking about these really broad buckets trying to move them up or down based on the review systems we got. And now this kind of new key factor of she's a refugee. And how does that factor into what we're thinking about? You know, with refugee health, that is kind of a field of medicine and a differential unto itself. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be thinking about things that we're not used to thinking about, like Lena and Devin, you guys mentioned TB and how that's immediately something that kind of jumps to your mind and a lot of other diseases or infectious etiologies that we might not normally consider. So Devin, you mentioned that your next step, if you're in the ED, is getting some more past medical, past surgical history, checking vitals, getting blood work. What kinds of things are you looking for on vitals, on physical exam, and what kind of blood work do you want? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime anyone comes in, you want to make sure they're stable. It seems like what you've given us, she's stable, but obviously I'd want to see if she's currently febrile, if she's tachycardic which would also support an infectious picture. Is she breathing okay, sounding well in room air? If this is like a pneumonia thing, you want to make sure she's like, doesn't need oxygen. And then in terms of labs, like I'd want to check her hemoglobin, look at her white count. That would also kind of point us towards an infectious picture. Obviously you want to rule out pregnancy always. So something to think about. That's a shout out to you, Lena. It's a future, so <laughs> future guy. No? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd also throw like a respiratory panel in there. Want to work up and try to get an idea of what infection she's having. You said chest x-ray, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you said chest x-ray. Potentially also like a speed sample. She's able to do that. I would probably also just get a blood culture just because, yeah. again, we don't know how stable she is right now. And I just did my ICU rotation. So I say get a blood culture. <laughs> yeah, and I guess EKG, they probably do. They probably would do. Even though we're like not concerned about right. ACFs, but. Not have tunnel vision, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So I ask and you shall receive. <laughs> um, so, so let's get into physical exam, labs and imaging, shall we? So for her vitals, her temperature is 101.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Heart rate is 73. BP is 112 over 52. Respiratory rate is 16, satting 98% on room air. Generally, she is ill appearing. She appears thin on HEENT exam. Membranes are moist, sclera non-icteric, non-injected. On neck exam, she's supple, no JVD, no appreciable lymphadenopathy. On skin exam, you don't appreciate any rashes, lesions, or bruises. On cardiovascular exam, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs appreciated. On lung exam, she appears to have a normal work of breathing on room air. Lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended, with normal active bowel sounds. On extremities, she has no lower extremity edema, and she is alert and oriented. Haha, -ha, wink, wink times three with no focal deficits. Her white count is 2.8 with a lymphopenia to 0.8, the rest of the differentials within normal limits. Her hemoglobin is 11, unknown baseline, MCV is 90. Her platelets are 340, her BMP is within normal limits. And then here we can see a chest X-ray 
notable for some opacity in this right kind of hyalur region. And then we also got an EKG that showed normal sinus rhythm, no evidence of ischemia, and her troponins were negative. Great. So now we have her vitals, physical exam, have some initial lab and some imaging. What kind of jumps out at you from this information that we have, either on the exam, imaging labs, what is key in your mind right now? We can narrow our differential a little bit. Wait. I mean, I think the first thing when I was like reading the thing that stood out was obviously the fever and then the, like, I think it said, I forget how it was phrased in the physical exam, but like thin, ill appearing. Mm -hmm. That makes me think like maybe something not so acute is going on. Like mm -hmm. this has been a week, but I don't know if I would expect someone. I'd have to lay eyes, mm -hmm. yeah. but like, right. I would think it'd be more right. of a chronic picture if that's the case. Although also in the setting of somebody with a potential like yeah. a unstable housing situation and we don't know what kind of accesses to resources and feed nutrition she has. So there could be, could be like two kinds of multiple components to for sure. The thin Ill Ill appearing part of it. I think we, I feel safe moving a cardiac cause further down the list because the troponins are negative. Just telling me there's no, you know, hopefully any strain on the heart, no evidence of a scheme on an EKG. So I'm not worried she's having any kind of heart attack or yeah, just general damage to the heart. And, and it's not a sinus. So not tachycardic. And the EKG is an ACG. But she was, she wasn't, and she wasn't tachycardic, her vitamin tachycardic. Yeah, yeah. Right, just okay. the fever, I think. Just the yeah. fever. I'm a little bit worried about her leukopenia. Yeah. That's concerning to me. We need to figure that out. Painful. We, need, we <laughs> do need to figure that out. <laughs> That's great. It's so funny you say that. But what does it make you think of? I think I don't remember the like. Well, you can have like really. You can have normal or abnormal in a twenty-four year old. Definitely abnormal. abnormal. It's too low. Yeah. I know that in sepsis it can get really low. Yeah. And then we had one line particularly down. So lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. I'd be like a lymphoma. Like a, do they go high? For a lymphoma, wouldn't they be high? Yeah. 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 So we're missing lymphocytes. Yeah. We're missing mm -hmm. lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like right now, what you guys are thinking makes a lot of sense. You, Alina mentioned that a cardiac cause a little bit further down on your differential now. Mm -hmm. If you had to say what your you know, two or three leading differentials are right now, or mm -hmm. what's leading on the differential, what would you maybe put there? I think some kind of infectious yeah. process, especially with the high level. No, I'm sure. thinking like TB is still up there. High up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think some kind of like hematologic malignancy yeah. is not off the table, given those lymph nodes and the lipopenia. Like a sarcoid, could that cause lymphopenia? Maybe. I feel like hyalur lymphadenopathy is also yeah. a but sarcoid. Yeah, no. or, or, I mean, it could be super, like an infection super yeah. on one of these situations. So. I think those are our top ones right now. Yeah, I think that sounds great. I think that you guys are really thinking about the right things really logically. At least I'm able to follow you. <laughs> so I think that the one thing that does jump out is the lymphopenia. And so I think there's one really quick point because it's something that is a little bit hard to conceptualize. You know, when you see it, it can be a little bit confusing. It's not something we see often. So this patient had a white cod 2.8 with her limb with the lymphopenia to 0.8. And so when we see a lymphopenia, that can often be a really broad differential, you know, which you guys are, have already started to mention, things like infection or sepsis, things like a malignancy, Devin mentioned sarcoid, which could possibly be a cause, which is all certainly true. Lymphopenia can have a really broad differential. It can include things like infection from bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic causes. It can be due to immunodeficiency. It can be iatrogenic from chemotherapy, radiation, or any immunosuppression or it can be caused by systemic disease like malignancy, sarcoid, autoimmune disease. And so is that something that helps us narrow our differential down right now? Maybe not necessarily, but something that is important to keep in mind for this patient. So I think that your thinking makes 100% sense. So with all this information, I just want to get your general feel on how this patient's looking right now. Is this someone who you're worried about as far as a sick, not sick evaluation? And, you know, we're in the ED right now. Is this a patient who you want to admit? Do you want to send her home? So what's your general feel right now for where we're at? I would admit. I would admit. Yeah. This I don't think, to be like I don't think it needs like ICU level care, but I would definitely admit to the floor. Right. I think she's relatively hemodynamic but stable. And then also like we talked about like unstable housing. We don't know how easy follow up would be, you know, like even if we're not concerned for like really, really unstable right now, like you want to make sure she gets the appropriate right. workup that she needs. So I would social component yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm worried about her. Yeah. 
and you guys are right on like picking up you know you're concerned about this patient and i love that you're like tuned in to the social aspects for this patient like you know is her situation safe to leave the hospital like you know some of that instability and like, especially given like there's all these things going on likely she would probably need follow-up after you know all the workup and i think you're right on track wanting to admit her and work up further great so he decided to admit is there anything else that you guys want to do next? Is this a patient who, do you want to start around anything? Do you want to order anything more for their workup? Any more information you want? What are your next steps for after okay. you admit? We have gotten, well, if we haven't gotten a TB culture, I want that. We did blood cultures, right? Yeah, yeah we did. Smart. I wonder if this is somebody, wait, no, I'm sorry. How do you evaluate? I think I would have to honestly look up like the lymphopenia, like how to evaluate I think a blood smear is good idea. Yeah. I would get a blood smear. And then I don't know if I, I guess I'd wait for TB and stuff. Yeah, I would say, so we got like CC, we got CMP, we got all the basic stuff. We got chest x-ray. So you mentioned you were concerned about infection. Is there any like specific infectious workup that you'd want to send other than the TB? Well, we got the RPP already, the respiratory, mm -hmm. right? Cultures. Cultures. There definitely is other workup that I'm blanking on. Mm -hmm. We got a sputum sample, we're getting culture on that. I'm trying to think of other. Yeah. I guess also I'd ask about like sexual health and like if we need to be concerned about like yeah. STIs, let's hear about. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So while you're HIV. waiting. HIV. Absolutely. Though you mentioned HIV. Yes, HIV. Good one. I knew we were thinking yeah. of something. <laughs> 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 yeah, HIV is a big one to us. <laughs> awesome. So we'll send all that stuff out. You okay. want to start around anything while yes. we're waiting? Mm, I wonder if we should start around some antibiotics. Yeah. Empirics and then. A little. I don't. A little narrow. Right. Like a little well, subtract, so is it? Is it? Yes, I think so. I don't know what empiric for like TB is though. Do yeah. you do empiric for TB? She needs to be eyes. <laughs> right. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. Good. That's that's good. Good. <laughs> yeah, the precaution. <laughs> <laughs> we need to put our N95s on. Yeah. So yeah. we would do that right away. Yeah. Probably start around fluids. I feel like we just. Yeah, I think we could start around fluids. Social like, consult. And get social work involved early on. Just so maybe we can help her with other things while well, she's in. Awesome. I think we got an awesome start. Lena wants some antibiotics. You guys want some more workup? I, I also want to give her some things to bring fever down. Okay. Like a little Tylenol. A little scheduled Tylenol. You want, you want to start a scheduled Tylenol for her? I would like to do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> if, we, if we start the scheduled Tylenol for her, is something like masking any of her future fever is something that you're worried about? I think it is something to think about. How high is her fever? It was to 101.2. It's not that high. Do you feel strongly anyway? Yeah, I don't feel strongly, but... I'm supposed to keep an eye on it and see if she yeah. wants the antibiotics. Yeah. You've convinced me. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an impartial third party. <laughs> All righty. So, a lot of good stuff that you guys just said. And right, on the, right on the money. <laughs> oh, thank you, I see you, rotation. Yeah, you got you to whisper <laughs> the Zithro a little bit, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so this patient was started on ceftriaxone and azithromycin for empiric coverage of community-acquired pneumonia. And we also got further history, like Devin mentioned. There is no notable animal or environmental exposure history, but she has been working as a sex worker for several years. So this patient's admitted, and on day two and three of admission, she continues to have fevers to about 102, and then the workup that you ordered comes back. So her HIV, she is positive. Her viral load is 500,000. Her CD4 count is 208. We also sent syphilis that came back as antibody positive. Her RPR is also positive with a titer of 1 to 64. And her quant gold also comes back positive. So a lot of new kind of key information here. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things I kind of want to hone in on to start out with. So we have this patient who is on empiric antibiotics, continues to fever, it sounds like up until this point, infection has continued to be one of, a, one of the leading differentials for you. And now in this workup, we have some new pieces of information like the positive syphil or like the syphilis titers, the quant gold, the HIV. So for these syphilis titers, I know sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to mm -hmm. interpret these serologies. What do you guys make of these, of the syphilis labs and the syphilis serologies? So both are positive, which makes me feel confident that she does in fact have a active syphilis infection. The antibodies keep on? I think if the RPR and the antibodies are positive, okay. it is, know. right? You're an ID girl, so. Am I? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, I, that's what I thought. I could be wrong, but I thought if they're both positive, then that can represent an active syphilis infection. In terms of her TB, 
her positive quantifying gold, I should say. Mm-hmm. I, I am questioning that, like if that represents an active TB infection or not, though. I think it's like you then do like chest X-ray and then. Yes. Well, we did the chest X-ray and there wasn't any like obvious. Yeah, like slam dunk TB. Exactly. Know? And in patients from like I know they do the what is it? Yeah, they the, do the PPB. Vaccine. Yeah. That can if it was less than positive. five, ten, or fifteen, depending on the group. Mm-hmm. That's right. Would be like consistent with TB. Right. It would depend. On but I think this is more specific than that, right? Is it? For sensitive, one of those. I need to review. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like to start, we are pretty convinced that she has an active syphilis infection based active. on the serologies yeah. that we've gotten. Well, an active HIV infection. An active yes. HIV infection. Yes. Okay. And then the quant gold, we're a little bit unsure how to interpret that. Right. Because I think she has a lot of risk factors for TB. Yeah. Like being from out of, I forget where she's from, somewhere that seemed high risk. And then also living in a sort of a refugee center that. Yeah. And she's now like technically immunodeficient too. And, and exactly. So I don't think I would be like comfortable totally ruling it no, out. No, yeah. That her x ray did. I forget what's next. I know. What's like that? Well, we're getting the cultures. Yeah. It's taking forever. But yeah. Mean? We're missing. Is there another test? I forget what it is. Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Poor blank. <blanket. laughs> this sounds good. And so, a few more pieces of the puzzle here that we just got. Yeah. And I think that what you guys were saying about the syphilis serologies makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I think that's spot on. They can be difficult to interpret, but based on you know what you were saying, Lena, the positive antibodies, the positive RPR, mm-hmm. or the RPR tire of 164, that makes you think it's more active. Uh, yeah, and so just one really brief point about that because this is something that I, that I looked into as well while kind of preparing for this case. When we're looking at syphilis serologies, we're often looking at treponemal and non-treponemal tests. And so the issue is that we generally can't only use one to diagnose active infection because of the high rate of false positives. So these syphilis serologies that we do rely on the humoral response to infection. And so they can also be difficult to interpret in patients with immunosuppression or an early disease both of which could be considerations for this patient. So it was found that about two to four weeks after exposure, almost a quarter of patients may still have a negative non-treponemal tests. And so these non-treponemal tests, what they're looking for is the reagent antibodies. So this is the RPR, the VDRL test. These are generally more nonspecific, but they're useful for initial screening as to whether or not we feel that there might be an active infection. And then as a confirmatory test, we would generally do a treponemal test as well. Historically, these have been more so used to confirm a positive non-treponemal test, but they're also becoming cheaper and more common to use as an initial screening test as well. So these are tests like the TPPA, the EIA, and the FTA antibodies. So these typically remain positive after infection, whereas the non-treponemal antibodies can decrease after successful treatment. And so these two tests are often used in conjunction to rule in or rule out an active syphilis infection. So, so it sounds like you guys are pretty convinced that there's a syphilis infection right now. I think so. If I'm interpreting everything, you're yeah. Doing. What do you want to do about it yeah. for her syphilis infection? Penicillin. Oh, penicillin. Great. I, uh, do you think that's yeah. the primary problem? I do not. Yeah. What do you make of her HIV labs, particularly the CD4? Yeah. Concerning. Concerning, and it's, it's less low. Yeah. But it's right on that cusp of. Where does that red. put us on the time course of her disease? Time course of it. Probably, I mean, I don't think it would like she was infected, like, recently. Like, I think it's more, yeah, chronic. this to me yeah. represents more chronic picture, especially because I mean, her viral load's also really, yeah. High. And yeah, I'm worried about her, yeah, immune system and yeah. ability to fight infection. And then your guys' discussion about the quad gold was pretty spot on, too. It's basically a good test of saying whether or not you've been exposed to TB. Mm-hmm. That's all it can say. Mm-hmm. Not good to determine active infection or not. The PPD skin test, which you were talking about, mm-hmm. it's kind of out of favor now due to like difficulty interpreting based on mm-hmm. like work exposure, stuff like that, and BCG vaccine. Now we primarily use the Quant Gold. Only can answer whether or not someone's been exposed to TB. Okay. So she's been exposed. She's been exposed, which perhaps is unsurprising. Yeah. Okay. So with all that, what are your next steps, guys? You have this patient, she's still fevering. She's on antibiotics. We have these new labs. Is this a patient who you want to TB rule out? And what would your workup be? What are your next steps? Call ID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, let's think. Well, so we got to 
I mean, yes, I want to roll a TB. I just don't remember what the next. Right. I yeah. want to roll a TB. Yeah. I also don't think those antibiotics are doing anything. Yeah. So also, I, doesn't she need to be on like PCP? Or, uh, I would, isn't that CD4 below 2 for 50? 50? Oh, something's below 50. Or is that just when I get? No, I think it's below 50. Okay. You guys are thinking about the right stuff. Basically, the <laughs> logistics of a TB rule yeah. out. Yeah. Airborne in isolation. Right. Special room on yes. particular right. floors and 95s. Right. To formally rule out TB, you need three separate sputum cultures, eight hours apart. Okay. We run MTB PCR, which is our best mm -hmm. test, to detect TB quickly because AFB and TB cultures take much longer. Mm -hmm. AFB staining faster cultures, they check them for eight weeks, mm -hmm. just to give you an idea of mm -hmm. how slow growing TB is. But the PCR is quick, relatively, like within a day or two, if positive, you'll, you'll get a call. Got so it. you think she warrants all of that? I do. Yes, okay. for sure. All of the above, please. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Let's do it. So kind of like Kevin just mentioned that, and like we just talked about, that would be our next steps in workup. You know, we have this patient who has HIV as well. And so the other aspect here, component that we want to think about in a TB workup for a patient with active HIV is that if their CD4 count is less than 100, then we also want to generally take mycobacterial cultures of blood and urine as well, in addition to everything Kevin just mentioned, like the butum cultures and the PCRs, et cetera. So let's go ahead and do all those things. Okay. So we got a CT chest that showed a consolidation within the right, within the right upper lobe with surrounding tree in bud opacity and a few calcifications. It also showed right hyalur and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. A broad infectious workup was sent, including blood cultures, bacterial viral fungal cultures, and her PJP, aspergillus, cryptococcus, toxo, viral hepatitis, I think I said that right, chlamydia and gonorrhea were all negative. And we got the, we tried to get the sputum culture as well, but she wasn't able to produce much sputum on her own or with induced sputum. So we called Palm and we asked for help with the bronc. So she got the bronc done and the sputum studies are pending. Okay, and here we can see this is an imaging of the C this is an image of the CT chest. Mm -hmm. So just as a reminder, there was a consolidation in the right upper lobe with the surrounding tree and bud opacity, some calcifications, and some right hyalur and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. So we got the TB workup. We have all the information from the previous slide as well. And now we have this new imaging. Are you now? Does your thinking change? Are you more or less equally concerned? I am more convinced that she's an active TB infection, given the, the CT chest. Yes, I agree. And I sure. am reassured that she doesn't have some of those other infections, especially given her H HIV positive. And her low CD4, yeah. And her low CD4. Yeah. But I think it's time to start treating her for active TB. Agree? Okay. So it sounds like you're, you feel like you have some pretty good evidence that we have an active TB infection. We have the positive quant gold. We're still waiting on the sputum studies from the bronch that Palm helped us out with. But in the meantime, you want to start her on some antibiotics? Oh, so we haven't- Oh yeah, like this sets of eight back yet. Okay, so I'm okay, we would wait. We would sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't realize that. I didn't either. <laughs> I just got really excited. <laughs> it's an interesting CT scan, I don't write it. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. So want to wait a little bit, hold the fort, it sounds like, while the but studies still, come back? it still remain isolated? Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Feel good about our plan. Perfect. Okay. Well, in the world of medicine, there's never a dull day. So let's see what happens next. I don't know. <laughs> so while we're waiting, she develops worsening, worse, worsening work of breathing with a new oxygen requirement to four liters. And if we remember the time of admission, she was sat in comfortably on room air. Mm -hmm. Her repeat chest x-ray shows a right pleural effusion. And CT imaging confirms that. <laughs> I'd say I'm just looking at the CT. Subtle. <laughs> Subtle. So what do you want to do now? Who do you want to call? What are the next steps? Ghostbusters. I want to call. Nice. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to put it right up. I know, I know. After three years, I know how to set you up for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm really concerned about her new oxygen yeah. environment. It seems like this developed rapidly over a very short period of time, and I'm not convinced that she's stable. But yeah. for now, as long as if she's stable on four liters, we can keep an eye on it, I think. Yeah. So, so she's got this right pleural fusion, which... It, it just happened so fast. Why did it happen so fast? Mm -hmm. Like, 
Well, do we get to know the time between the CT and the time before that? The one before? Two days. Two days? Two days. Two days. Well, like one hour. I mean, it would be nice to like get some food from it and look right. at it. Right, I think it's worth getting mm. it. Getting a little Tap it. <laughs> Tap it. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? What's that called? Pleurocentesis. Thoracentesis? Ah. Thoracentesis. <laughs> I was like, Pleur- <laughs> 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 like, what? I'm like, what? I'm like, what are we doing with that? I'm like, Pleura? Yes. No. Yeah, Thoracentesis. So IR does that, right? IR? Or Rastic surgery. You want to go to medicine, right? Do you want to do one of those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we have been doing paracentesis. Yeah, so I didn't, there you go. I didn't know we could do these. So who does That's the paracentesis of the lungs or the thoracentesis? The pulmonology. Yeah. Uh, the whole Dr. Gates in it. <laughs> okay, so we would consult pulmonology. Let's get some blood. Perfect. So we get the thoracentesis. So the thorax shows a white count of 1250. 24% neutrophils, 59% lymphocytes. Red blood cell count is 1,000. Glucose, 65. Protein is 6.8. LDH is 803. ADA is 87. Normal is less than 9. And the pH of the fluid was 7.31. And we get the Brock results back. That is TB positive in all three PCRs. <laughs> and acid fast cultures are later found to be growing. TB as well. Okay. So now we have these plural fluid studies. What do you guys make of them? What is her? What are her normal? Is that gonna show? Sure. I can see that to compare. <laughs> okay. If, if only. <laughs> yes. What's your approach to plural? Like this what? Like lights criteria. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, what? What does lights criteria help with? Deciding what type of effusion, whether it's transudative or exudative. Or exudative. Great. What do you think about yeah. these labs now? So it's, that seems like a lot of white blood cells. Yeah. So makes it me, right, which makes me think it's, it's more infection. And yeah, I do think it's related yeah. to the TB. I think that's true. Yeah, LDH is high. Where glucose is like, I forget. Like it's kind of long. I was like, I guess a lot of red, red blood cells too, right? Yes. Do you, I don't know if you think about that. So no, you don't. But just, yeah, could be from the poke stone. Yeah, and the LDH is just high. And the LDH is just high. So I would say this is more of like an infectious etiology. I wouldn't be worried about malignancy at this point. Okay. So you guys mentioned a lot of great things as far as differential goes and what could cause an exudative. What are some things that we think of, or that you guys think of, that could potentially call the transudative? And what are we kind of comparing these to? So what, what do you think of that could potentially call the transudative? And how I usually we know think that? of like cirrhosis, heart failure. Right. Or things that it's just like fluid. Nephrotic. Like nephrotic. Yeah. Right, like fluid back yeah. in the lungs. Mm-hmm. Sure, absolutely. And based on these studies, it sounds like you're leaning more towards exudative, um, more infectious. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we mentioned lice criteria, which Lena, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> do not have her based on the values. Exactly. <laughs> but just as a quick, you know, reminder, what do you guys remember? What lice criteria are, and what kind of thing were they? You know, I can't see, but my so hands are all over my face. I know. <laughs> you can do this. I'm breaking your heart. <laughs> okay, so it's. LDH, two two thirds of the normal. Yeah. And then is it protein? Yes, I just. Oh my gosh. She didn't know this. Except she was not that long ago. For me, it was not that long ago. (laughs) 0.5? Yeah. Amazing. 0.5. Yeah. Nice. What's the other one? Is it. it... LDH? No, we said that. You guys are basically there. Sorry, we're like really blanking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so life's criteria, like you guys mentioned, it's the plural, it's the plural fluid over serum protein ratio greater than or equal 2.5. Plural fluid to serum LDH ratio greater than or equal 2.6. Uh, right. And then the plural fluid LDH greater than or equal to two thirds the upper limit of normal. So those are really useful for us if we have the serum values as well, which here we don't. And so you guys talked about how you were leaning towards an exudative effusion just based on looking at these numbers. And so the scoring system that we can use for that is the PFO3 score. And what that looks at is only taking into account the plural fluid studies. So this score has some advantages over lights criteria. It doesn't require the use of a blood sample. Lights criteria contains two out of their three criterion that both include LDH. So the LDH ratio and the plural fluid LDH. Whereas the PFO3 score has three distinct measures that doesn't have that same overlap 
with using LDH twice. And studies have actually also shown that there's a similar accuracy between the two scores in diagnosing exudative effusion. So the criteria that we're looking at for the PFO3 score is a protein greater than three, a cholesterol greater than 55, and a pleural fluid LDH greater than two thirds the upper level of normal. Okay. So sounds like based on that criteria and your just clinical intuition, we're looking at an exudative effusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why do you think they have the effusion? I would think it's related to the placebo. Yeah, exactly. Infectious. Yeah. Sounds good. Be my first vote. No, I agree. Yeah. That's what I was gonna say. Great. Perfect. So, if there was a TB caused pleural effusion, so a TB pleuritis, mm -hmm. uh, are there any criteria that you're aware of? And it's totally okay if it's no, because I had to research this and learn it. <laughs> but things that you're looking at for a TB pleural effusion that would point you towards that. Well, there's one up there I don't recognize, so I'm going to say the ADA. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. So the ADA is an elevated level of an enzyme that is produced from lymphocytes. And so if that ADA level is increased, which in our patient it was, 87 based on a reference range of about less than nine, which is considered normal, mm -hmm. that pretty strongly points us towards a TB pleural effusion. You know, we also might see straw colored fluid, proteins typically greater than three, sometimes greater than five. It's typically a lymphocyte predominant leukocytosis, the LDH is typically greater than 500, pH less than 7.4, often 7.3, so pretty acidic. The glucose is usually between 60 and 100, and if you were to do a biopsy, then you would generally see caseating granulomas. So these are all things that, if we see them, would point us towards a TB pleuritis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so AD is adenosine deaminase. Oh, uh, yes. Remember that now. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> awesome. All right, you guys, so we have all this information. We have these plural studies. What's your final diagnosis and your final thoughts on what we want to do for this patient? All right, so this, ha this patient has the active tuberculos tuberculosis infection yes. complicated by TB pleuritis, superimposed on like HIV. suboptimally controlled HIV yeah. in infection. And syphilis. And then like also disease. active syphilis infection. <laughs> but the big, big one is the TB. Sounds great. So let's see what happens. Final diagnoses, like you guys mentioned, pulmonary tuberculosis complicated by a TB pleural effusion, also with a new diagnosis of HIV consistent with AIDS and late latent syphilis. So for this patient, she was started on RIPE therapy, monitored for two weeks, and then she was able to be discharged with plans to continue her RIPE therapy for eight weeks and then have a discussion about starting HAART therapy. And she also received three doses of IM penicillin for her syphilis. You guys did Three. it. <laughs> and I think it's important to remember that this is also a patient you should talk about birth control with. Yeah. Coming mm -hmm. from OB-GYN. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, and thinking back to the beginning, Devin, you had mentioned early on, yeah. considering like, you know, it could be multiple things. It doesn't necessarily have to be one yeah. thing. So sometimes I think about like Falcom's razor, what's the thing that unifies the diagnoses, but like sometimes, you know, patients can't have as many diagnoses as they want sometimes. So here, you know, there's multiple things going on. So always important to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Great job. And also that HIV can't go so fast. One last point about TB treatment and then we'll wrap it up. Sounds good to me. Sweet. So we mentioned ripe therapy mm -hmm. for TB treatment. What medications would be included? Rifampin. Isonize. Pure. It's like something with like that. And it was it. Is it erythromycin? No. No, it's Ephambutol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a P. Pure yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, something that Thanks. starts with the P. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So ripe therapy, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Standard of care is generally six months of treatment with two months of intensive therapy with five to seven times per week treatment, followed by four months of continuation therapy. And the one key to think about in this patient is with starting antiretroviral therapy in a patient with active TB. So the recommendation from the Department of Human Health, Health Services is to start antiretroviral therapy about two to eight weeks after TB treatment is initiated and to not wait until completion of TB treatment before starting antiretroviral therapy. So in pulmonary TB, if a patient has a CD4 count less than 50, we wanna start within two weeks. If a patient has pulmonary TB with a CD4 count greater than 50, 
we want to start antiretrovirals within eight weeks. And this also might vary depending on the patient's specific clinical picture, how ill they are, and their ability to really tolerate taking multiple simultaneous medications. And one other thing to consider is that rifampin medications have a lot of various interactions with antiretroviral therapy as well. So it really has to be considered on a patient by patient basis and what specific medications that patient will be on both for their HIV and also for their TB treatment. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. And the big concern is iris, mm. like reconstituting their immune system right. with starting antiretroviral therapy. Got it, okay. Well, it's a good learning. Yeah. Such a good Fantastic good work. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel rusty. Yeah, we're not, <laughs> yeah, not my best work. I'm <laughs> for <four>, really. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. Person, time, and place. See you next time.